Hello again boys and girls and welcome to episode number three in the series that focuses entirely on building a solution architecture document. It is Friday 6 p.m. but I had to jump on recording this episode right after work so I can get the episode out for you guys as soon as possible. So after reviewing the SAD in the first episode, we went ahead and started looking at the foundational components of the solution architecture document, the business view, the process view, non-functional requirements, and the conceptual view. And as you have noticed, rather than writing the whole solution architecture document in one document, what I like to do is separate them in small Google Docs. It's just a personal preference. I use Google Docs for building the documentation and I use Lucid for building the diagramming. I'm not sponsored by either of them. I mean, I wish, but these, are, these just happen to be the tools that I use in my daily life. So let's dedicate this episode to review and add more chapters or more views to the solution architecture document that we've been working on. And the chapter we will be working on is basically the solution architecture. So I'm going to create a new one. As you know, my name is Elias. I'm a senior solutions architect. Now let's do this. So we haven't done any solutioning so far. All we have been doing was building the foundational work. We were trying to get as much information as we can to, and to try to understand the problem from various perspectives, various domains, various people, various departments. But it's all going to change now because step five in my book is the step when I start really describing the solution from an infrastructure perspective, from a data perspective, from a security perspective, perspective and also from an implementation perspective. So it's in this section that we are going to dive deep into the various components of the architecture that we will be working with developers to implement and maintain and test and deploy and review after deployment in order to keep maintaining it. And let's start solutioning by adding the information view. And this section is really important. It provides the user navigation flow to the new feature that we built. Why? Because ultimately I want my end customers to get to the desired page with the minimum clicks possible. Let's do this. Of course, it depends on the feature. But for this one, let's say when someone hits essence.com, we have four menu items, the men's wear, women's wear, everything else, and then search. And I think for selling luxury cars, we will put it in everything else. So this is the first click. And here I am just rebuilding that flow that is on the page to give me a starting point. So we're going to put our new page under everything else. Right? And under everything else, we have categories, activity, home, kids, pets. So we will add luxury cars here. Pretty straightforward for this use case, but it depends on the application, whether you're building a customer facing, a back office application, how your end users find the feature that you're building should not be a random choice. So basically it takes me one click, two clicks in order to get to the desired page. Not bad at all. I've seen a lot worse. And so I want to make this super easy for everyone reading this documentation. I'm an orange guy. Um, orange is my favorite color. So let me just put over orange all over the place for the desired flow that we are going with. And there you go. I will just include it in the document and we can move to the next view. I like dark mode, but let's just put everything by default. And now we get to move to the application architecture or application view. I've actually seen also some people calling this the information uh, architecture, just different nomenclature. And so now we start thinking about the development team. So we want to provide them with more implementation details, something upon which they can build their uh, application. And so let's build the application architecture together, including, uh, you know, not only the computing and the storage, but also caching, CDNs, networking, databases, streams, queues. Let's do this together. And so as you remember, we've already built this conceptual view and we will use it as a starting point. Before, so we, before we even started solutioning, we've sat with different stakeholders and we started thinking a little bit about the whole concept of this feature that we are building. So it got reviewed, it got approved, and now we're not starting from scratch. Um, developers know what to expect. For example, our QA teams know what to expect. DevOps know what to expect. So we have a starting point and we'll take uh, our conceptual view as a starting point in order to build 
our application architecture. So requests are coming in from a customer and let's say we use Route 53 because based pretty much we are on AWS at this point. So let's say we are using Amazon Route 53 as a DNS resolver to intercept all those queries coming in and then route them to the correct components. After Route 53, probably we are using CloudFront um, in order, you know, as a CDN. So let's just put Amazon CloudFront in here. And so now we start thinking, how are we going to build this feature? Am I going to choose a serverless route, put all my compute in a serverless, in multiple serverless um, Lambda functions, for example? Am I going to use a container-based application? Uh, am I going to just use VMs and an EC2 and just build my own VPCs and stuff like that? And again, something that we've done earlier is going to come super handy. So we go back to the non-functional requirements and let me zoom in a little bit. And so we go through our non-functional requirements and let's go for example to the operability. And here I just filled some dummy data, so it's not gonna help us much, but, but you can see how this would be super helpful if we done it correctly. And again, I will link the video where I talked extensively in details about how to build a useful uh, and efficient non-functional requirement document that you could use. So for example, we see that we need to build a solution that needs to be durable for at least three to four years. We needed we need to follow the standards of SAM framework, Node.js. Actually, I shouldn't have included SAM framework here, but let's just say uh, the expertise that we have in-house is around Node.js 146. <laughs> no, 16. Uh, so we only have expertise in-house that is around uh, JavaScript. And let's say we don't have a dedicated DevOps team. So we know that serverless would be a great choice since it's going to give more power to developers and it's going to allow them to move a lot quickly, right? But that's not all. Let's look at something else. Availability. So we want our application to be available nine, nine, like four nines all year round. Let's say that's year one. Um, and so again, a serverless would be a great solution for this because we don't have to think much, very much about the whole um, deployment process and blue green and stuff like that. Lambda functions make that super easy for us. Now let's say under reliability, fault tolerance, overload behavior, we have talked to our marketing people and they informed us that for the first 30 days of launching the feature, we expect up to 5,000 transactions a day. It's just a dummy number for now. So this obviously will now influence the amount, the type of compute and the type of data storage that I will choose. And there's various approaches to solve this, for example. And this reminds me of a video I published recently called Own the Base, Rent the Spike. And I think that would be a good choice for this one. For example, if we know that our base would be 5,000 transactions per day, and that amount of transaction is going to be stable, you know, for the first I don't know, for the first year, we can then choose to build our solution in a containerized manner. And then we can do some tests in order to right size our containers to basically find the right amount of CPU and the right amount of memory that our computer, that our container needs to do uh, to handle all these transactions. And then go to AWS and purchase, you know, what we call reserved instances. So purchase all the instances that we need in advance and AWS will provide you a significant discount if you purchase the reserved instances up to three years. Uh, if, I, if I recall, I need probably to check documentation if it didn't change recently, right? So we can cover our base for up to three years and we get a significant discount. And then for all these spikes that we can get occasionally, then we leverage Lambda functions for that. And that's because we can write a Lambda function as a container and deploy it as if it was, you know, a Docker image. But that's a discussion for another day. And you can watch the, the video about own the base, rent the spike to know more about this pattern. But for our use case, I want to use as many serverless services as possible. So let's do this. So obviously I would need a Amazon API gateway, right? To put it here in order to intercept all these requests. And then behind uh, my API gateway, I will have, let's say a Lambda function and then the Lambda function, um, you know, for persistence, let's just use, so let's use an Amazon DynamoDB. And so we have the happy path request coming in, going through DNS, CloudFront, API gateway, compute here, storage here. So let's say that obviously for pictures of the cars, we will use an S3 bucket. I don't like this icon. So I know that the buckets are, there you go. 
and S3 buckets uh, here. We can also start looking at caching and we can implement caching at multiple levels here. We can have, I mean, of course, obviously we have the CDN here, but Amazon API Gateway can have caching as well. You can, for example, add an Elastic Cache Redis instance here and then have our Lambda function read always from the cache, right? Rather than reading from the database. And then we would have a different trigger here to rehydrate the cache every time there's a change in the database. So for example, every time our uh, sales team, warehouse team, whoever operations team lists a new car, so they will write directly to the DynamoDB table and that would trigger a Lambda function that will then rehydrate the cache. Right, so it will it will add basically that new car in the cache automatically every time there's an update, a delete, or an insert. And so our lambda function automatically always is just reading from our cache, which is gonna be super fast. And yes, obviously we can add here, uh, you know, as a, as a circuit breaker or the unhappy path. So it can go directly read from the database if it can't find anything in the cache at this point. And so the files themselves will be stored in the bucket. And let's say we are building, and th this is a GUI basically for our operations team to add new cars or edit the cars or, or upload pictures and whatever. And that reminds me that we want them to also write and read to the same bucket. Right, super straightforward, nothing really fancy here. This Lambda function, let's call it list cars. And this flow is basically the one that we use to list the cars. Uh, we'll probably have a different flow here about purchasing a car. And right, so here basically this is a get request. Here, let's say it's a post request. Someone goes to the form, fills everything, chooses the car that they want, hit the submit button. And here, rather than just having one Lambda function, maybe we want to have a step function because we have multiple things that we need to do. And how do we know what we need to do? Again, we go back to our process view. And we know that when someone sends a request for a car, it needs to go to sales, then the order needs to be recorded, then we need to check with the warehouse. So you see that all the work that we've done before now comes in super handy and allows us to move fast. So let's say just to have fun, we are going to build this in a step function manner. This would be a step function. And if you haven't used step functions before for this specific use case, don't forget that there is two types now of step functions. There's the express workflow and then there's a the standard workflow. And the express workflow is pretty much built for uh, um, um, handling requests coming from, you know, an HTTP gateway, pretty much HTTP requests and so within our step function we will have one lambda function that that records the order yeah let me just let me just remove every, everything that i don't need record order and pretty much is going to do it in amazon dynamodb and after that we need to check with the warehouse maybe the warehouse provides an api you know so here we have a different api gateway that we call check the warehouse availability the warehouse will respond and then we will have a different function that will then catch that response and maybe format it maybe uh do some kind of aggregation so like it goes to a different data provider in order to get that information so I can have as many steps as I need here and then at the end I send back a response to my customer again it's highly unlikely that you design a solution in five minutes but I'm just you know trying to walk you through the process in here all this different and so in the application view oh my god I'm tired <laughs> Let's push through this. And so as you see in the application architecture view, we end up mapping all these various flows according to the business requirement. Something that you also probably always want to do is send metrics, you know, record them in order to run some analytics on them later. So, you know, we might, we probably will have some kind of data lake where we clean this events and then we store them into our data lake. So other teams can run their queries and, and generate their reports on them. And so basically this is our application architecture view for now, let's move on. So once you finish mapping all these flows, usually what I do is I exported the view and then I imported it into document number five, the solution view under the application 
architecture. Remember, there's a link in the YouTube description below where you can download all these documents so you can use them as a foundational work for your next solution. But does this mean that we are done? Well, not yet. We still need to provide a view for the data architecture and for the security architecture at least. But that's gonna be in the next video, so give this one a like and click here to watch it.